get to speak to you guys in chapel again today, which you see on the Gospel of John, <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to that. As you guys know by now, uh, what do I do usually when I uh, start speaking in chapel, or right at the beginning? Yeah, a joke from Peter. <clears throat> and uh, I told a few of you that I was going to try to do a video of Peter, but that didn't actually happen. So, how about I tell you a joke and a funny story? That I did substitute. Not that you really had a choice, but anyway. Um, okay, I'll tell, you the, uh, I'll tell you the funny story first, and I'll tell you the joke, and then uh, we'll jump into John. Uh, funny story. Um, <clears throat> Peter uh, has been losing teeth. Peter's in second grade, if you didn't know this. Peter's been losing teeth lately. And it's kind of funny to hear him talk about it, uh, because to a kid, uh, this is, you know, it's a big deal, right? And, and some of you may remember that, and you may have siblings that are losing teeth. Um, to a kid, that's a really big deal. It's like a mark of maturity. You know, my teeth are falling out, so I've almost arrived, uh, at least to Peter. And uh, anyway, and so, you know, um, we talk about things like the tooth fairy, and, and those of you guys who are in my Bible class know that I would not lie to them and deceive them uh, about the tooth fairy or Santa or anything like that. Uh, but we still do the game because it's fun. Uh, but Peter and Andrew are both smart enough to realize that there really is not a tooth fairy, it's really me, okay? So Peter lost a tooth uh, yesterday. Yeah, he lost a tooth yesterday. First bottom tooth, uh, one of the bottom teeth that he lost, he's lost his front uh, top teeth already. But Peter lost one of his bottom teeth. And so this was a big deal. This was like a new phase uh, for Peter. So not, not, not just the top teeth falling out, but the bottom teeth are falling out. And so Peter and I had this conversation yesterday about the tooth fairy. And of course, Peter, again, is smart enough to realize that I and actually the tooth fairy, and uh, not an actual fairy of some type, but Peter's okay with that because he still gets loot out of it. So I was talking to Peter, and Peter's like, you know, Dad, I think bottom teeth are worth more than top teeth. <laughs> and I'm just like, Peter, you know, and of course this is in the context of Christmas where my kids just cleaned house. I mean, they, they, we had a pile of junk that they got for Christmas, and, you know, and, and so I'm like, all right, Peter, you know, <clears throat> what, do you, what do you think is a fair market value for bottom tooth? Because, um, you know, it's happy, they usually do like a dollar. And maybe you think I'm a cheap state, but usually like a dollar, you know, and, and we're good with that. Well, Peter looked at me, and Peter, of course, knowing that I'm the tooth fairy in actuality, Peter said, hey, Dad, do you think the tooth fairy knows that I have a Wii? You know, like the video game system. And I'm like, yeah, Peter, I think the tooth fairy knows that. And, and Peter's like, I, th I think I should get a Wii game for a bottom two. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Peter, it's probably not going to happen, man. Uh, probably not going to get a Wii game. Peter's like, no, Dad, it, it would slide under my pillow. It'd be fine. Like, you know, it's, it's not a problem. And, and so Peter and I had this conversation, and, uh, and he got a dollar. That's what happened. So. <laughs> Good Peter's story. All right, here's Peter's joke, and then, and then we're going to pray in the Gospel of John uh, for a few minutes today. Okay, Peter's joke. All right. What do you get when you cross a polar bear with a jalapeno pepper? Close. Anybody else? A polar bear and a jalapeno. A chili pepper. Peter yeah. thought that was great. All right. There you go. Um, okay, transitioning. I'm going to go to the French horse then uh, to uh, the tourist shift years, and then we're going to get into the golf course done. Okay? You guys can listen up to it and jump into that and just spend a few minutes today and then move forward. Uh, let's pray. God, I thank you again for the morning that we can gather here. Um, I'm humbled by the uh, responsibility to, to talk, uh, to talk to your people this morning and, and to try to share your word. And I want to pray for your help as I do that. Uh, but I pray for each of the, the people here. Uh, I pray that you would give them uh, the ability to listen and the ability to think this morning. And I pray that uh, your truth and the relevancy of your word uh, would be clear, would be helpful today, and that your spirit would have freedom uh, to work and to teach and to lead uh, all of us today as we, as we consider uh, what your servant John uh, wrote to us about Jesus. And um, I want to commit the time to you. I want to pray that it would be helpful and useful as we move forward uh, today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, as you see on my PowerPoint slide, uh, we're, we're going to start a series in the Gospel of John uh, today. The series is basically going to go for the entire rest of the year. Because uh, John's a good book, we've got a lot of chapels and so on. So we're going to do a variety of things to move on with the Gospel of John. Now, I'm not swapping out the theme for the year. In fact, I wore the shirt, one, because I wanted to wear the t-shirt. But our, our, our theme for the year is still Solus Christus, right? Christ alone, we sang <clears throat> Cornerstone, Christ alone. That's still our big theme for the year. And if you were thinking back sort of about what we've done this year, what I wanted to do in the fall, what I had some guys come in and help me with, in the fall is we talked about Christ alone, and we specifically talked about different topics related to Jesus. So, for instance, we heard a message on uh, Jesus' life. We heard a message on Jesus' death, his resurrection, uh, and so on. So, so the fall was sort of topical Christ alone. That's what it was, all right? Uh, the spring series, I wanted to do a book of the Bible. Now, even though we're going to take a bunch of chapels to do the Gospel of John, we're not going to be able to do every single verse in there, but I want us to take uh, the spring semester, the spring term here, to consider the Gospel of John. Okay, so that's what we're thinking about. 
Now, I've, I've been around enough and, and been here at GCI long enough to know that me saying that does not necessarily have you on the edge of your seat, right? Um, and, and I don't think most of you would be rude enough to say, that sounds boring, that sounds awful, we don't want to do that. Um, so, so I kind of get that, right? But that may not be the most riveting thing you've ever heard uh, as far as that goes. So I want to start out uh, with what I'm calling a reality check. I'm just trying to see what you guys' expectations of chapel are today. Okay, before we get into John, I think there's probably a couple different kinds of people out here today. I'm going to try to explain this list and, and kind of see where you fit in. Okay? Uh, I think when, when some people come to chapel, uh, I think that we have the people that, like my first uh, sub-point there, people that say I'm so tired, and then before they get to the end of that statement, they're already asleep. Uh, th this is the ones, again, I'm not trying to make you feel too bad right now, but these are the people that actually like stake out the seats on the wall, and you bring your backpack, and you bring, of course, your hoodie that you're not going to wear in the halls, but like you, you actually like set up a little bed, and you plan to go to sleep. And if you're not lucky enough to get one of the seats right on the wall, uh, you, you, you just position everything, you've been at GSA long enough to know exactly where the crook in your neck has to be on the back of the chair to just pass out, and this is sort of like Friday nap time to gear up for the weekend, uh, and so on. And, and I get that. I'm not terribly happy about that, but I get that. Okay? Some of you, that's, that's where you view. I think there are other ones of you that are what I'm calling the holiday parade commentators. Uh, some of you do this in class every day, not just chapel, to where you sit near one of your friends and you sort of do the, the holiday parade banter, right? Uh, any, anybody watch like the Rose Bowl parade or anything like that? Is what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, to where you have like celebrities or whatever that'll be watching the parade and constantly they, they, they make comments, right? Like that float was built by these people and it has you know 82,000 sequins on it and, and and this is the 14th time it's been in the parade you know and, and kind of this 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 constant banter and I think some of you guys come to chapel and that's sort of your plan right you sit next to a friend and you make comments about everything uh, you know you, you kind of elbow your friend and you do sort of this silent laughter thing where where your friend is is laughing and, and they look like they're laughing but they've only been muted you know so no laughter's coming out and and, and that's sort of your play uh, in chapel chapel sort of something you feel like you need to add commentary to. And, uh, and, and, and you just love that. Um, next person up here. Next person up here is the entertain me or else person, okay? Entertain me or else. That's probably the person that's like, okay, I'm gonna stay with Mac uh, through the Peter joke because that might be mildly entertaining and I might use that later. But then after that, uh, I'm just gonna let his amazing voice put me to sleep and uh, it, unless he entertains me. So, so it's like, as a speaker, you've got like 90 seconds to wildly entertain everybody or everybody just checks out. That may be you. Um, Next one is, is what I call uh, This Is Dumb, and, and, and this is a certain crowd of people, this is a certain demographic in the school that doesn't just do this for chapel, uh, you do this in class, you do this at pep rallies, you do this on your sports teams, to where everything is dumb, right? This is dumb, chapel's dumb, the chairs are dumb, the stage is dumb, the PowerPoint slide is dumb, everything is dumb, you know? And, and you guys laugh, but that's the demographic we've got, right? To where if we handed out free money, you'd be like, this is dumb, it should be more. I mean, and you guys laugh at this. You guys love it. There's that demographic there, right? But this is done sort of the unpleasable person. And I think, I think sometimes that's the attitude that comes into chapel. Last one I've got up on this slide uh, is the person that says, solve all of my problems, but then in parentheses, of course, without offending me or asking me to change in any possible way. Uh, so this is the person that comes to chapel, and maybe you're having... Um, I don't know, maybe you're having boyfriend girlfriend issues, maybe you're having issues with your parent, maybe they confiscated your, your phone, or you got grounded, or you're failing a class, or whatever it is, and sort of your view of chapel is, I'm supposed to show up at chapel, and the chapel speaker is supposed to give me a 10 second sound bite that will solve all of my problems. So like, fix my problem, fix my life, but as you do that, you know, don't meddle in my life. Don't, don't actually confront me with anything, don't make me think, and definitely don't ask me to change anything in my life. So sort of solve my problems for free, and then I'll move on. Well, whether or not you fall into one of those groups, maybe that was sort of a cynical way of looking at you guys, but whether or not you fall into those groups, it sort of begs the question, why a series on the Gospel of John then? Because I'm, I'm the first one to admit, a series on the Gospel of John, done by various people that we bring in, is probably not going to keep everybody away. I get that, right? Uh, it's probably not going to uh, necessarily be the, your, your favorite thing to be a commentator on as you sit here and watch. Uh, it's probably not going to be the most entertaining thing you've ever seen. Uh, some of you are still going to say it's dumb, and it may not solve every single problem that you've ever had or ever conceived of in your life. So why a series on the Gospel of John? Why are we starting that today? <clears throat> all right, I want to start with why John wrote his book. And I put all the texts up here on the screen today, because really today's message, really I'm not necessarily dwelling sort of in one passage like I typically do. We're sort of overviewing different things. And throughout this semester, I really want you guys to bring your Bibles to chapel, um, and, and such, but today I've got them all up on the screen. 
And I wanted to start with sort of going to the end of the book of John and, and sort of asking John, if I can put it that way, why he wrote his book. So this comes from the end of the Gospel of John. You know, read and follow along with me, or if you'd like to turn your Bible, you can. This is what John says about writing his book, okay? Here's what John says. John says, at the end of his book here, John chapter 20, John says the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. And of course, last time out, John is one of the disciples, right? You got that? Okay, John says, but these, these specific ones that I wrote down, okay? But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So if we could sort of ask John why he wrote his book or why he wrote down the exact things that he wrote down, John would say, I wrote down these stories and not anything else. I picked, handpicked these specific stories because these are the stories that will help you know Jesus and have life. That's what John said. Um, it would be interesting to think about being one of the uh, disciples, especially one that would write a book about Jesus. I think it would be really hard to narrow it down. Now, some of you are probably thinking, I hate writing, and any time you have to write a five-paragraph essay, you, you borderline flip out, and so you can't imagine writing anything that long. But imagine if you actually got to hang out with Jesus for three years. Just think about that for a minute. There's a lot of stuff that you could put uh, in that book. Probably funny stories, short stories, jokes, you know, whatever it might be. There's a lot of stuff you could put in there. And John, under the inspiration of God to write this gospel, handpicked these specific stories. So he could have picked other stories, but he handpicked these ones, right? He says, these are written so that you'll believe, so that you will come to faith in Jesus Christ. But one of the things that we're going to see, I think, today a little bit, and then as we go through the series, is that to John, believing and believing Jesus is not a one-time deal, okay? It's not one day when you were six years old, you prayed a prayer and accepted Jesus, and now you're not believing Jesus anymore, you're sort of doing your own thing, and then on Judgment Day, you're going to remember that you trusted Jesus, and then, um, then it's all good. No, not at all. For John, believing Jesus is, is, a, is a first step, but it's an ongoing thing. It's a continual thing. So John is saying, I'm writing these things so that you come face to face with Jesus Christ and believe in him, believe the gospel, but that is supposed to keep going in your Christian life. And I think we're going to see that in the way that uh, John describes Jesus. So that you'll believe. Believe he's the Messiah, believe he's the Son of God, and by believing in him, you will have life. And just like we said in John's gospel, believing is an ongoing thing. In John's gospel, eternal life is a now thing. It's not just an after-I-die thing. Uh, John says in 1 John, another slide I'll put up here in a minute, John says, he who has the Son has life. Like right now, it's a right now thing. Right now thing for us. Not a perfect life, but eternal life. Life from God. And John says, I wrote my gospel so that you meet Jesus, so you continue to believe in him, and so that you could experience the life of God right now and forever, but right now. So John says, by believing in him, you'll have life. Then John says something sort of interesting here, again, by the power of his name. That's how John ends this. By the power of his name. The power of the name of Jesus. Now, I think we get, at least I hope we do, that John here is not saying that, like, Jesus is a magic word. You know, so that, uh, you know, if you're afraid of the dark or something, you just say Jesus all a bunch of times over and over and over again, uh, or anything like that. What John means here by the power of Jesus' name is that there is something unique and powerful in, in the times that we come face to face with Jesus and the Word. Or to put it another way, you do not confront Jesus Christ and leave unchanged. And I think we're going to see that in the Gospel of John. The different people that come and meet Jesus in the Gospel of John, whether that's Nicodemus, whether that's the woman at the well, whether that's the guy that's blind, Jesus heals them, he gets thrown out of the synagogue, uh, whoever it might be, people do not meet Jesus and come away the same. And I think we'll experience that. You won't meet Jesus in the Gospel of John and be unchanged by it. So John says, this is why I wrote my book. Uh, but you'll have life, but you'll believe. All right. Summary statement, really quick, and we'll keep rolling on today. So I want to get to, uh, to a few more uh, application type things. So why did John write the book? John believed the specific stories he recorded about Jesus were the most helpful and most significant things. So John picked them for us, right? Uh, they'd be the means by which God would give life. John says, I mentioned this already, he who has the Son 
has life. It's an ongoing thing. Right? It's not a one-time thing, only it's an ongoing thing. Jesus says, and I want to read these quickly to sort of overview it, but Jesus says these things in the Gospel of John. And I want you to notice, as we read some quotes here from Jesus, how this is really about him. It's about knowing him, about trusting him, but how it's an ongoing thing. Okay? Jesus says in John 10, Jesus says, my purpose is to give them, the people that believe, to give them a rich and satisfying life. That's what Jesus wants to give. I'm going to give them a rich and satisfying life. John chapter 6, Jesus says in John 6, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. So using a word picture, Jesus says, I'm the bread. I'm the bread that is better than the bread that Moses gave in the Old Testament. I am the bread of life. And if you come eat this bread, you're never hungry again. But do you think Jesus means that's a one-time deal? I don't think so. I think he means come and continue to be satisfied by this bread and you won't need anything else. Other stuff Jesus says in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, John chapter 4, Jesus says, those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. Got an ongoing thing of believing that he is the water that is good, the water that is better than any other water, but then we keep coming back to him, we keep coming face to face with Jesus Christ and drinking the water, if we can put it that way, and we're never thirsty again. Next one, John chapter 8, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Okay, Light of the world, if you follow me, ongoing thing. Right? If you follow me, if you keep walking, keep following me, keep believing, right? You won't have to walk in darkness but you'll have, because you'll have the light that leads to life. John chapter 10. My sheep listen to my voice, right? We're the sheep, he's the shepherd. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. It's got to keep happening, right? Keep following him. He says then, I give them eternal life, and they'll never perish. Now, we could go on, but I hope you're getting the sense of what uh, John said at the conclusion of his book. That he wrote these things so that we come face to face with Jesus, so that we would believe and keep believing, so that we would be given life and continue living this eternal life that comes from God himself. That's the purpose of the book. That's why John writes this. This is what John wants us to get. So, here's the summary, and here's where I want to sort of uh, land it here just momentarily. I've got a handout we're going to hand out in a minute, but here's sort of the summary, and here's the why are we doing this in chapel, okay? A satisfying, happy, joyful life is available by knowing Jesus. Um, maybe we can pause there for a minute and just think to yourself, do you really believe that? I mean, I know you're like, okay, he's a Bible teacher, this is chapel, Christian school, yeah, and you know, I'm supposed to believe that, but do you really believe that? Do you really believe that you can have a joyful life in Jesus? Or you see Jesus and, and Christianity and the Word of God as this oppressive thing that sort of rains on your parade, holds back all your fun, is this miserable, awful thing that, that you just have to do because you have to go to the school. And do you really believe that? Now, notice we didn't say a problem-free life, right? But we're saying a happy, joyful, satisfying life is available through knowing Jesus. Secondly, knowing Jesus is an ongoing experiential thing. It's an ongoing experiential thing. We mentioned that a minute ago. But when Jesus uses terms like eating and drinking and following and walking, these are ongoing things. Or to put it another way, it's not like we meet Jesus one time and we never have to think about it again. We want to keep coming back to this. We want to continue to study Jesus. We want to continue to come face to face with him. And, uh, you know, and I think, I think a lot of people would relate to that. You know, it's interesting if you talk to people that have known Jesus a really long time. Uh, maybe like a pastor, maybe if you have a grandparent. Uh, talk to people that have known Jesus a really long time, uh, especially those that have walked with Jesus a lot. And it's interesting to, to, to talk to them and to hear how Jesus and the person of Jesus revealed in the Word is still a challenging thing. Uh, you never figure Jesus out. Uh, you, never, you never really get to the bottom of Jesus, if I can put it that way. Uh, Jesus is, uh, is, is an ongoing thing. Lastly, then, to know Jesus is to understand facts about him and trust him completely. So you have to know some things about Jesus. We're going to see that in the Gospel of John. Jesus is going to describe himself a lot in the Gospel of John. Uh, uh, things like we had up there, right? Bread of life, light of the world, living water, those kind of things. But beyond that, Jesus is going to be the Son of God. Jesus is going to be Messiah. He's going to be these different things. He's going to describe himself. We've got to know those things, but then we've got to trust them. Um, quick example. Think about the bread of life. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Um, if I had bread up here, which I don't, but if I had some bread up here, you'd have to, and you wanted to eat it, okay, because you're hungry and you haven't had your snack break yet or, or whatever it might be. Um, if, if I had bread up here and you wanted to eat it, you'd have to first of all know that I had bread up here, right? 
Not like a surprise thing, like I was hiding it, I was hiding it back from you. You'd have to know it was up here, but you'd have to trust me. Uh, you'd have to trust me not to, uh, I don't know, you know, spray deodorant or ax all over the bread and hand it to you. Right? You'd have to, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if you trust me or not. Would you trust me to do that? Trust me that it's good. And I think this is going to be the challenge of Jesus. <laughs> Knowing facts about Jesus in the Gospel of John, but, but then moving into that trust realm. Not just knowing that he's the bread of life, but are you willing to put it in your mouth? Um, not just knowing that he is the living water, but are you willing to not go to other water? I think that's going to be the challenge of the book. Okay, so as we move on then, we're almost done today. All right? GCH Apple Series. We've got a couple of guys who are going to do a handout for me. If you guys can go ahead and do that while I'm talking, that would be great. Okay? GCH Chapel Series. We're going to do a chapel series throughout the spring semester. One of the things that we'll do, as you see up here, is we're going to have a series of messages on John. Now, some of these are going to be sort of traditional messages, kind of like what I just did, where we're all going to come in here and sit and listen. Other ones, we're sort of thinking about a few other formats, and we'll get into that. There's going to be a series of messages on the Gospel of John. The emphasis of these messages is going to be on who Jesus is and what it means to trust him completely. Now, that's kind of the self-explanatory part. The part that these guys are handing out, they're handing you a half sheet of paper, and on this half sheet of paper is something called a reading plan. Now, when I had this stack of paper, my wife saw it, and my wife, who's an awesome, amazing person, when she saw that, she was like, you're not really going to give that to a bunch of teenagers, are you, because they're going to think it's homework and hate it, and, and so on. Well, okay, so she probably made a good point. But back to this stuff, I'm still going to hand it to you, all right? But don't think of this as homework. Think of this as us, as a group of people that God has put together into the Greenbrier Christian Academy, Collegiate Academy, for the spring of 2015. God has put this group together, and think of this uh, as us making chapel bigger than just Friday. Okay, so let me explain what this handout is really quickly. This handout is a reading plan. And again, I know for some of you, uh, if I say reading, you just sort of recoil because you don't read anything more than 140 characters or whatever it is, and, and you just don't like reading. Well, what I'd like to do is on this handout that you've got, we've got a series of topics, a series of messages, and what I'm going to challenge you guys to do, and I'm absolutely serious about this, is to actually read through the Gospel of John two times this spring. And if you take time to look at the schedule, you'll see how I've got that broken down to where you're reading certain chapters of the Gospel of John. Now, for three weeks, three weeks, think you can handle that? Three weeks? I think you can. Okay? Uh, if you want to be an overachiever, you can do it twice a week or something like that, but there's three a week. So you see, for instance, the week of one night, there was no reading because you didn't know it was going to happen. You see the topic, and then there's no key verse for this week. But if you notice, next week, the week of 116, so the week ending in the 16th, I'm going to challenge everybody in here to try to, during that week, read John chapters 1 through 3. Okay? So you're going to read that. You're going to read it outside of chapel, right? John chapters 1 through 3, what you're going to read. You see that the topic will be considered next week, and then there's going to be a key verse. And that key verse is how we're going to open chapel next week. So we're not going to do the catechism. We're not going to do the one from Colossians. We're going to open with that. What I'd like for you to do, um, what I'm going to challenge you guys to do, is to try to read through that outside of chapel before Friday so that you've got John in your head, and then focus in on that key verse. So, for instance, for next week, if the sermon's coming from John 1, 1 to 18, and I've identified 12 as a key verse, what does John 1, 12 mean? I think it'd be good if you consider memorizing that verse. Now, again, you may look at me like I'm crazy and think, okay, you're a Bible teacher and you can make me do that in your Bible class, but I'd never do that outside of class. Well, think about it. But if you really want to know Jesus, we want to read the word, we want to memorize. So that's going to be a key verse, okay? So I give me a paper copy. <clears throat> now, again, I've been around GCA long enough to know that after you guys leave, I'm going to have to pick up approximately 27 of those off the floor. Um, and I get that, and it's not going to hurt my feelings, although I'd like you not to drop them on the floor. But there's a couple of the ways that you can get to this, this reading plan, okay? A couple of the ways that we do that. Uh, paper copy is what you've got in your hand. It's on the GCA website as well, okay? Right now it's on the GCA website, and it's under Collegiate Academy Forms, okay? So, uh, you know, as, as, as I think through that, and, and the reason we wanted to put it on the website is here's what I'm thinking. If you read your Bible on, like, your iPad, or if you read it on your phone, not right now, don't pull it out. I want plausible deniability, all right? Don't pull it out right now and show it to me. All right, but if you uh, read the Bible on your iPad or on your phone, and you, and you want to do the reading plan, and you don't have this piece of paper because you dropped it on the floor someplace, or it's in your locker, go to GCA website, and you can pull it up. You can bring it up, and you can figure out what you're, uh, what you're going to do there. Last way that we're going to do this, and this is sort of an experiment. Uh, we created a Twitter handle for Chapel. All right, now, so I kind of thought you were just laughing at me all of a sudden. Yes, we actually did. Okay, we did, really. All right, here's the deal. If you're on Twitter, 
Um, and your parents are okay with it. Uh, follow at Gators Chapel on Twitter. And what we're going to do with that, if you're on, is we're going to tweet out reminders about the reading program, uh, perhaps little quotes from Chapel, key verse kind of stuff, but that's a place that you can comment as well, right? Uh, you can tweet out something if you want about the Chapel program and such, and we're going to try that. Now, that may fall flat on its face. A week from now, thanks, Bell, give me one more minute. Uh, a week from now, we may have you know all of two followers, and I may be one of them. I don't know. I'm willing to risk that though, okay? And I'm not going to get up here and do some cheesy thing to like you know make you try to follow you know Gator Staff or do some cheesy giveaway. You know the you know one of the first ten followers. You know no, nothing like that. But here's what I would say: If you're on Twitter, follow Gator Staff. See what happens. We're going to try that, okay? So that's the reading plan, of the reading program. So everybody understand what I'm asking you to do with this. This is not homework. There's not going to be a test, there's not going to be a quiz on it, but this is an opportunity for you to make chapel bigger than just Friday. Okay, three applications and I'm done. I know the bell rang, but three applications and I'm done today. Okay? So how do I want to apply the message today? Even though the message today was a lot more information and not so much Bible text, three ways to apply it today, and then I'm going to pray and get you guys out of here. All right? First application, join with us in doing the reading program. And I really mean that. I really don't think I'm crazy. I don't think I am. Okay? Uh, join with us in doing the reading program. Um, if you're skeptical, join with us. You know, prove me wrong. <laughs> Do the reading program and see if it makes a difference. If you're not skeptical, join with us. Prove me right, okay? Uh, but join with us in doing the reading program. Jump in. Make it happen. If nothing else, for all of you in study hall, we complain that you have nothing to do. There you go. Read in study hall. Make it happen. Join with us in the reading program. Secondly, discuss the Gospel of John with at least one person each week. So if you're doing the reading program and other people are doing the reading program, bring it up. Talk to them about it. Uh, talk to your parents about it. I know gasp. Talk to your parents. But when you, you know, when, when you're when you're sitting there on the weekend and you're doing family dinner together, and the dreaded question comes up from your mom or dad, "Hey, how was school this week?" And, and of course you don't want to answer that, right? Because you, you just don't want to. Uh, bring this up. I'd say, hey, this guy, you know, is crazy enough to think we're actually going to do a reading program in the Gospel of John, and you know, he wants us to follow on Twitter and all that kind of stuff, and bring it up. Talk to a parent about it. But again, try to make chapel bigger than Friday. Do the reading program and look for one way to discuss something about the Gospel of John during the week. Last thing, and I'm done. Take some time to pray and ask God to work in your heart each Friday before chapel. And again, I really mean that. Because if, you, if you're coming to chapel and you're looking for me or some other guy up here to be uh, essentially a stand-up comedian that's going to change your life you know, without meddling and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, apart from God working in your heart, um, none of this is going to work anyway. So take some time to pray and ask God to work in your heart in chapel. If nothing else, you have to be here. right? You don't have a choice. I get that. But, but make it useful. Try and ask God to help uh, teach us all in chapel this semester. Okay, so can you guys do that for me? I think you can. Maybe. At least nod your head right now and make me think that so I feel better about that. <laughs> all right, sounds good. You guys, listen well today. One fast announcement, but I'm going to pray and get you guys out. Uh, one fast announcement. I was asked to announce again for the guys uh, in D lunch at the Bible study. God's Bible study is happening again today. Uh, so come out to that if you're one of the guys in D lunch. Let me pray for us, and then when I'm done with my prayer, you guys will be free to go. Let's pray. God, I thank you again for another uh, morning to meet here. I thank you for the chapel time that we can set aside uh, to consider the Gospel of John today and to think about uh, the series and what this could mean for us as, uh, as, as, a, as an academy, uh, as friends, as, as classmates and such this semester. Um, God, we acknowledge that if you don't work in us, if you don't reveal truth to us, if you don't change us, uh, it will not be effective. Uh, but we have confidence that you want to work, that you want us to know and to follow and to taste and to drink and, and, and these things that we've read today. And I want to pray uh, that you would do that. I want to pray that you'd be grace, gracious enough to work through your word in our hearts this week. Uh, I want to pray that you would um, help us to consider the gospel of John, that it would be effective, that we would see Jesus and be changed by it and changed for the positive. I want to pray for all these people here today. I want to pray for a good and blessed remainder of the day uh, today. I want to pray for a good weekend ahead and a good end of the semester. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys. You guys are dismissed.